Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. If you're a visitor, we're very glad you're here. Can you all turn together to the uh, chapter 6 of the book of Romans? This is our, our uh, practice over the last you know, month and a bit, uh, uh, last few months. At each, each baptism service, we've uh, gone back to Romans 6, which is a, a chapter largely about baptism, but it's only secondarily about baptism. Primarily, it's about the, the Christian life, and we'll get there in just a moment. But let me add to a couple of the announcements uh, that Vic just said. Um, we have... Uh, up on YouTube now, uh, uh, our conference videos from just over a month ago, our Stand Firm conference, which was about revival and revival in our nation's past, and we trust by God in her future. Uh, all of those sessions are historical sessions, theological sessions, practical sessions. They're all up online, free of charge, etc. So please share them, watch them for yourself, and get praying with us for a revival in our nation. Uh, next week is also Hope Reformed Baptist Church's 16th birthday. Yeah. There we go. So please come. There's going to be... Ah, uh, there's a team making it, doing all the birthday stuff. There's going to be a photo booth and a cake or something and a fireworks. We're going to have, uh, I'm, I'm coming in on a zip line or something. Uh, the, we, we've employed a Pentecostal to just make it a tremendous day for everybody. I'm just kidding. So, but do come uh, with thankfulness in your heart to God because uh, this church has been through much by God's grace and by God's grace, you will accomplish much for his glory. So please come uh, and uh, uh, invite your friends. Um, also, uh, but, uh, our goal this, we, this year as a church is to get uh, 50,000 gospel tracts, which we write, source, and print here at, at church, get 50,000 of them out into the community literally anywhere you go. So you're going overseas on a holiday, are you a Jew? You take 1,000 tracts and hand some out, and you're, you're an international missionary. Uh, on your street, in your workplace, to your friends, go into the city and hand them out. As a team, as a church, as a mission agency, as a local uh, a, 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 a army for the Lord God, this church, we've uh, endeavored to get 50,000 tracts out. Now, we're a little bit over halfway through the year, about three quarters of the way through the year, and we are 20,000 tracts down. Praise God. So 20,000 are out, and we have yet 30,000 to go. Now, there's plenty of us here. If we all take 1,000 and ditch them by the end of the year, there will be plenty more than 50,000 out by year's end, and we trust next year there'll be even more going out. So please uh, ask one of the deacons or uh, one, somebody who looks like they know what they're doing and ask for a wad and uh, pray that the Lord might use you this week to get rid of some of them. But we are in Romans chapter 6. Now, Romans chapter 6, like we said, is a sermon, is a chapter, rather, about the very essence of the Christian life. The, it starts out, Paul having described the gospel in chapters 1 through 5, really, in how we are now in a status of peace with God, and we are justified, and there's not anything, any sin you could ever commit that can ever break that, because the more you sin, the more grace you get. And the, the, the question that arises in the Christian's heart and mind, though, is, what about my life now? What, until, what about until I die? What about uh, my, my life that I'm supposed to be living now? Is, is it the case, then, that since, I, since I'm promised grace, no matter how much I sin, if I just hold on to faith in Jesus, I can sin all I like, live for myself, and I'll just keep on getting grace? Now, Paul doesn't really say no to that question. He doesn't say, no, there's a limit on grace, you can only sin so many times and then it runs out. He rather says, you're wrong for a whole different reason. Not because you're thinking, uh, not, not because you don't get that much grace, but in fact because you're thinking of grace in the wrong kind or in the wrong way. You see, when you've placed your faith in Jesus, here's the tremendous twofold part of the grace that God gives to you. You're not just given forgiving grace, cleansing grace, grace that uh, discharges your debt before God so that you don't have to go to hell now. You get that. You get forgiving grace, but you also get transforming grace. You also get the kind of grace of God in your life by His Spirit, by the power of Jesus that changes you. So Paul's answer to, uh, if I just keep on sinning, I'll just keep on getting grace. He says, yes, but the great thing is, Christian, you won't just keep on sinning. You won't be perfect. You won't get sinless entirely before you die and go to heaven. You will be perfect and sinless in heaven, but to arrive at utter sinlessness, you have to be bodily dead. So that's, that's, the, that's the jump and the leap at the end of our life and sanctification that we'll make, yes. But while you're in this body, you won't be sinless, but sin will lose its grip and will lose its reign over your lifestyle and your behavior. That is a promise from God. 
So let's read uh, chapter 6, verse 12 through 14. This is where Paul starts to get even more practical uh, with his exhortations in this chapter. Paul says, by God's spirit and with God's authority, verse 12, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. May God bless that word in our midst and to God's glory this morning. Paul is getting to the essence of the Christian life. We, we look at these on Baptism Sundays because it is a challenge, a calling, a commission, a reminder of those being baptized. This is my confession of faith. This is the life I am being called into. But it's also good, just as it is good for us to watch baptisms, those who are already saved. And uh, it is also good for us to hear Romans 6 and be reminded what our calling is, what our commission is to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we look now at verse 12. We're going to take today under three headings, the prohibitory exhortation, the practical advice, and the promissory foundation. I just went nerdy with the words because they rhymed and had alliteration, but we'll go through it. First of all, verse 12 and the beginning of verse 13, Paul gives us a prohibition. I would remind you that as he speaks, he speaks with the authority of the one true living God. These are not suggestions or ideas or possible things that a Christian might agree to. It is a command of God himself. And he says, therefore, don't let sin reign in your body. The beginning of verse 13 says, do not give yourself up to sin. This is the command of God. So that if we are stuck here in our thinking, well, how do I even do that? What does that look like? How might I uh, practice that? Before we get there, we must settle in our minds, God said this, I must obey. Whatever this entails, this is a command of the one true living God, triune in his being, glorious in his attributes, authoritative in his speech, and he says it right now through the pen of the Apostle Paul. All of us are enjoined by the blood of Jesus Christ and the indwelt spirit to obey this text. Do not let sin reign in your body and do not offer your members up to serve sin. We said again, this is where he starts getting quite practical in this broader passage of chapter 6. Really, Paul's applications or Paul's commands in chapter 6 have so far been this. Know for a fact what the gospel says about you. So you think, I'll just keep living my old life of sin and God will give grace. And Paul says, you don't know, you're not thinking right about the gospel. Let me tell you the gospel. So first of all, know that in the gospel, your old self died, your old life is gone, you are indwelt by the Spirit, you are alive in Jesus Christ. So know that. The second point of application, which is very much related, is is a mind level, heart level uh, 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 application. He says, recognize that. Get up in the morning, and when you don't feel like it's true, slap yourself in the face, spiritually or physically, and tell yourself, it is true. It's it's true beyond you. It's true above you. It's true for you. It's not true because of you. You didn't make yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. God did that to you. He assured you of it in the Scriptures. The life of the Christian is constantly saying, shut up brain, listen to the Word of God, shut up heart, obey the Word of God, recognize God's Word as true, and my experience as false. So the Christian has to get up, and Paul says this in verse 11. Therefore, you must, so another command, you must consider yourself dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is a command of application. The power is that as we consider ourselves that way and think that way and recognize that way, everything in our life changes. The third thing that he then applies is, if you know this, if you are recognizing or believing this, making the intentional decision to believe what God has said about you in Jesus, the next thing you need to do is yield over. Some of your translations won't say present here in uh, verse 12 and 13. They'll rather uh, use the language of, of yielding, of, of giving up. And that is, that is the language of our, of our body and our life and our behavior. Our mind must know the truth. Our heart must submit and recognize it as true for us. And then our body, in our life, in our behavior, we must yield ourselves over to that truth that I am dead to sin and I am alive in God 
because of Christ Jesus. So this is Paul's exhortation. Know these things as true. Before we go further, let me explain some words. Here in verse 12, at least in the language of the ESV, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey it. The mortal body that he's speaking of is really uh, your whole experience as you are now before you die. Uh, When we die, we go to heaven, we are a disembodied soul, but we are perfect. That is the the spirit of of, of saints are in heaven, perfect before Jesus. I don't know exactly what it looks, feels, or uh, uh, is like. Uh, That's uh, an experience I have not experienced, uh, being disembodied. But we will be perfect souls. In the day of the great resurrection, we will be given bodies just like Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 15 says that in the future we will rise victorious. We will rise immortal, rise incorruptible. And those bodies can't sin, can't feel anything or think anything that are unglorifying to God, that are sinful. They can't die. They can't get sick. They don't fade away. They are glorified bodies, immortal bodies. Right now, we have life by the Holy Spirit given to us. Yes, we are one with Jesus spiritually, yes, but we are still infected and affected by our mortal frame. That is that our memory fails, our thoughts confuse us, our hearts contradict ourselves, our body even afflicts us. Uh, We fall into temptation, we are lied to, we are ignorant, we choose temptation uh, uh, over righteousness. So this is our mortal body. It is not just finite, but it is weak and it is limited. And, praise God, it's dying. (laughs) For for the Christian, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, this old man is fading away and eventually it's going to breathe its last sinful breath and I'll be in glory with Jesus forever. What a day. So the, the, the principle is this, that in your body, though it is infected and affected by sin, I'll just use... Calvin's language here, commenting on this text, he says, though sin dwells in us, it is inconsistent to say that sin will be so strong as to exercise its reigning power in the Christian. For the power of sanctification ought to be superior to it. That is, yes, of course you have sin in you, but that sin in you does not have, objectively, does not have more power in your life than the Holy Spirit has given from God That same spirit which raised Jesus Christ from the dead is now reigning and living and empowering in you so that you might overcome sin and its passions and its temptations. That's what we mean by mortal body. The body that's limited but indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And then he uses this other word here in verse 13. He says, don't present your members to sin. Members. What does that mean? That, that is, uh, in the literal Greek, it's the language of limbs, your body parts, the ones we can see, your four main limbs. Uh, we could add the head, the mind, uh, but then add all sorts of other organs, your, your tongue, your, your brain, your, your eyes, your, your ears, uh, the, the parts of you that we don't see, the parts of you that we're glad we don't see. Uh, all of you as a body, your, your whole self, all the makeup of you. But we can extend that uh, uh, conceptually and say, not just what you are physically, but what you are as a whole person living a whole life. So you have a career, you have uh, attitudes, you have uh, a legacy that you're leaving, you have an employment, you have money, you have children that you parent, you have uh, ways of thinking about the world, you have uh, uh, entertainment or recreation that you engage in. Every part of you is really a part of your members. That's your, your whole life is uh, uh, a part of your self, of your whole life. So Paul is really saying here... His command and his exhortation of prohibition is this. Don't let sin reign in this life now until you die. Don't use sin in your mortal body as an excuse. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body, though it's there. And the members, your body parts, and all of you, every part of you and your life, should not be presented to sin. So we are talking about an immediate, a until we die, a since we've been saved, a spirit-given sanctification our whole life long, That will affect every part of our life. That's what Paul has in mind in these verses. So there's the prohibition exhortation. The the next thing we'll look at is the practical advice. So Paul has said, don't let sin reign. Right? And and often we, we, again, we we said this like a month ago when we looked at this verse under another heading. You say that, and most Christians, most modern, sort of 21st century 
Christians who think that Jesus is a lot like a therapist and he sits down and he listens to you, but he doesn't tell you what to do or tell you things are your fault because that's non-judgmental therapeutic care and that's uh, actually not acceptable under the AAHCCA uh, CRAP uh, guidelines. You're not allowed to do that and tell me anything's my fault. Here's what Paul says. I love you. I'm your pastor. I want to see you in heaven. I want you to be glor- uh, glorifying God in your life. Everything's your fault. Bye. You know, go home. Be better. <laughs> He says, no, no, in the life of the Christian, every sin is there by your allowance. It's all your fault. That, that's not loving, that's not kind. And Paul's mindset is this is extremely kind to alert you to this. Now, of course, people sin against you. Of course, of course, there have been things in your life that you don't control and that are not your fault. But what Paul is getting at, what I'm meaning to say by hyperbole, is that for the Christian, Paul's call is one of radical responsibility that makes no excuses. Zero excuses. Any sin occurring through you in your life is there, according to the logic of verse 12, because we let it be there. That is that our members are being used for sin by our own choice. And that's what verse 13, verse 13 starts to say. So here's his, here's his practical advice. Verse 13 says, do not present your members to sin. And I, I hear what you're saying. You hear that and go, that doesn't sound any more practical. <laughs> that doesn't give me any more wiggle room. Because often what, what we think, it's my experience, you know, over the years, speaking to a lot of millennials and a lot of 21st century, dealing with a lot of people online, and listening to a lot of other pastors and preachers and reading their books and reading the Christian living stuff that comes out on some of these Christian bookstore shelves. Here's what we think practical means, right? Practical means give me more excuses to sin more in my life. Now, that's what practical usually means. Right? Paul says, don't present your, your members to sin. Serve Jesus. And we go, oh, could you be more practical? Oh, yeah, well, don't beat yourself up when you do sin lots. Thank you. This is way more practical. You really helped to apply the Bible to my life. Paul does not limit or decrease the intensity of the demands for obedience when he starts getting practical. So don't, don't hear me say practical and then think, oh, this will make it easier. <laughs> not easier. Not easier. He's just going to highlight for us the steps we ought to take mentally, heart, uh, on our behavior. He's going to highlight the steps we need to take in order to aim at, to arrive at this glorious thing called not letting sin reign in our mortal bodies. Look at what he says. Verse 13 again. Do not present your members. Present. Remember, we we talked about that, that language. It literally means yield up. Do not give them over by your free will. That, that's, that's the language of the verse. That word is, a, is an offering. So here's what, here's what Paul's picturing us to do. When we are allowing sin to rule and reign in our life, he's picturing us as taking an arm, taking our tongue, taking our wallet, taking our mind, taking our eyes, walking them over to sin, placing them upon the uh, bench of sin and saying, use these for your good as instruments of warfare against God. That's the language of instruments there too. The the language of verse 12 and 13, when uh, when he says instruments, literally the Greek word there is armory. It is weapons, weaponry. Stop giving your limbs, giving the parts of your life freely over to sin to use it in the war of unrighteousness against God and against your soul. That's what he's saying. And we might think, I don't do that. What a ridiculous scene. Can you, can you imagine the, if we were to apply it to maybe like a bank robbery? We're trying to picture what Paul is, 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 is telling us that we do in our Christian life. We let sin, here's the picture, right? A, a, a huge, let's just go right out and say it, Maori. Uh, 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 security officers, right? They could crush anyone. And they have these 12-gauge, right, we're in America now, 12-gauge shotguns on their uh, 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 chests, and they are standing security in a bank, very wealthy bank, very rich bank. But this bank has overgone some uh, legal trouble in the recent months, and the founder and CEO has been uh, 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 kicked out and fired because of misdealings on the, mar- uh, on, the, uh, on the stock market. And he is now, he's out for revenge. And he walks, now he's a skinny uh, little uh, British guy, um, can't bench his own uh, weight or anything near. And he walks into the bank and he's here with his nasally voice to inflict damage upon anybody that stands in his way. And he's going to march off with the millions and billions that he built in this company, in this bank, right? Here's the scene. No one's threatened, right? You're the clerk. This is how we're imagining it. You're the clerk behind the little 
counter, you don't even hit the button that drops the shields, right? You've got three enormous security guards with a full range of ammo and 12-gauge shotguns. You're not scared at all. Kick him out, right? <laughs> Do what you will. Hurt him. You're not scared. Until, though, by his cunning and just by his speech, like, I built this place, I, I started this place, you should have been there day one, all oh, the things that I've been through, you have no idea what I've sacrificed for this company. And as he, as he listens, you know, these, these security officers just go, yeah, okay, well, if you say so, I guess your name is on the building. Okay, and one by one, they hand over their shotguns to this, to this dweeb, to this lying, illegal criminal who built the... And you behind the cloak, you, you, you're going to start yelling out and going, please don't. <laughs> you're our last line of defense. Why are you giving over voluntarily your arms to him? He has no right here. He has no authority here. Stop doing this. And that, 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 that mindset you might have as a clerk, yelling out to the security guard, that's what Paul is saying to us. He sees us as these security guards who have everything we need in Christ Jesus to say no to sin, to remind sin that it has no authority here, and to kick it out of our domain. He sees us as sort of handing over our limbs as weapons so that it might inflict more damage upon us and the bank in which we stand to then rob us of joy and all sorts of other riches in the Christian life. That's what Paul's saying. And, and of course, from that perspective, that's a ridiculous scene. What a, what a silly and contradictory thing sin is in our lives. That is, we, we intentionally, though we've been given all the armory to fight against it, we allow sin to take control of our lives. It's a hard pill to swallow. It's a difficult, it's an unpopular message to say to Christians who will uh, maybe lean back on things like addictions or, or, or powerlessness. I can't stop this. And Paul's loving rebuke to you is, you can and you must in Christ Jesus. Paul, of course, acknowledges that what many Christians might feel. Look at, look at verse 12. Do not therefore let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Paul acknowledges, sometimes it does feel like, and it really is like, sin is making you obey its passions. Maybe that's the, the, the experience you've got with sin, that you really lean on. I don't, I, don't, I don't let it. It makes me. And Paul says, yes, it makes you, because you let it make you. Like, of course, it's, it's at the driver's seat because you opened the door, got out, got in the passenger seat, and allowed him access to the gears, the steering wheel, the buttons, and the knobs. That's how it happens. So Paul is saying, if I can just say by mere reminder, radical Christian responsibility over the sin in our life recognizes that we are to not present our members like that fooled security guard. We're not to present ourselves over to sin to serve Jesus, uh, to serve unrighteousness rather, but present it to serve Jesus. Here's, here's a second uh, way that it might happen. If in one hand, the cunningness of sin, the deceitfulness of sin causes the Christian, like that security guard, to get intimidated and, and hand over the arms of the body and the flesh. Oh, you're so powerful, you have authority here. If that might be one Christian's experience. Another reason that sin is allowed so much sway in Christians' lives is by mere passivity. Passivity. That is that some Christians are living their lives, and they're Christians and they're going to heaven, but they're kind of on a factory reset mode. I, I think the kids call this being an NPC, right? You, you, you jump on, I'm just showing the, the generation divide here and who got that joke and who doesn't. I, it's like you go into some online games and there's many characters in the game who are, they're not, they're not backed by an intelligent human being with a console. They're just, the computer just puts them into there so that they can sort of run around and, and be extras in the game and they're the ones who are just walking up against a brick wall and who say the same thing every time you talk. They're on factory reset mode and some Christians are living their life that way. That they have an unassessed, an unexamined life. That they haven't genuinely thought to themselves, is all that I do and all that I am actually maximally leveraged to kingdom gain and God's glory? Sometimes that passivity is, can be likened to a, a mindset that may, maybe too many people have with like a mechanic. A mechanic might tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, make sure you've got clean oil in your car. And you go... Duh. Like, what do you think? I walked up to the, my old mechanic and said, please put dirty oil in my car. <laughs> no, it's fine. Y yeah, 
that, that's, not how, that's not how oil works, okay? Are, are, are you vibing with me? Like that, that's not how oil works. They put it in clean. Eventually, it gets dirty. Go check it. I don't need to check it. I put clean stuff in. Okay. <laughs> right? Like maybe, a, maybe a musician about to give a, a grand performance in an orchestra and, and, the, and the, I don't know, conductor, what are they called, uh, says, you know, make sure your instruments are tuned. And the violinist goes, this guy. Like he thinks I've intentionally distuned and bent and I've put the wrong strings. I don't need to check that it's tuned. I, I didn't detune it. Uh, and of course, any expert musician, any, any casual car driver or mechanic knows that there are things you have to assess regardless of whether or not you made an intentional decision to destroy them. And the Christian life is like this. When we really think of all that, all that encompasses our members in life, our finances and everything we spend money on, our bodily actions and everything we do with our flesh, our mentality and how we think about everything called a worldview, our ambitions and our dreams, and our goals, our recreations and what we watch, listen to or spend time doing in entertainment, uh, our speech, our meditations and what we think about when we're on our own and dream about, our skills, what gifts you have that you are using, your career, and your parenting, your family, the suburb you live in, everything, everything is a part or is a member, is a limb of you in life. And the unexamined Christian life will lead to ruin if you do not genuinely, intentionally assess are each parts of myself, are each of the members in my body, my whole life, are any of these presented to sin presently? Are they yielded up? Are they given over? And like somebody might say, you know, some might say, check your house for termites. And you might say, yeah, I, I didn't go and purchase a thousand tanks of termites and pour them into the timber in my house. They're not there. You might say, no, you need to pull down some plasterboard. You need to assess the timber. You need to get somebody in who can help you assess it. You need to know. This is the call of Paul. Don't assume that because you are a Christian, that because you are baptized, or that because you are going to heaven, that you have an assessed life and that no members in your body or life are presented to unrighteousness. Rather, assess your life that you might present yourself to God. And that is the next thing that he says to do. Verse 13, do not present your members to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. So check that. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. This is what we call the universal and the particular. He starts really broad. Present your whole self to God as one brought from death to life. And then he goes particular and specific. And present each one of your members to God for righteousness' sake. So on, on one hand, we want to say, is your whole self God's? And you need to say, yes, and I must present myself as so. On the other hand, are you particularly, are each parts or members or limbs of your body and your life, are they all presented to God? And so we need to say amen to the universal and amen to the particular as we intentionally assess our life. Here's what Paul says. Your entire self is one bought from death to life. The, etern the entirety of your human life. That is every Christian's morning uh, uh, mentality. Every morning we wake up, and this ought to be, uh, uh, in other words possibly, but in our mind and in our hearts. I am awake and I am alive. It's pretty basic biology, I suppose. But this is our confession. I'm awake now. I am alive to God and I am, regardless of how I feel or what things maybe I did just last night, or the things that uh, racked my brain during my sleep, or the things of my memories that attack me, regardless, I am awake, I am alive to God, and I am dead to sin because of Christ Jesus. It's a confession. Reform and, and like, a, like a blacksmith might constantly have to reforge his hammer to make sure that each day is it, in, it is in uh, ship shape for use. So also the Christian must continually beat the mind into shape. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. He made me alive by faith in his son. I have been brought from my sin-filled, hell-bound, sin-sick, condemned, powerless life of slavery to sin and death. I have an inheritance before me in heaven and the Spirit of God within me. I am alive to God in Christ Jesus 
Father, send me to do your will. Or as the song we just sung, Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose. This is the constant Christian profession. And then he says, not just the universal, present yourself to God as one alive from dead, from death. But he also says on the particular, on the specific, present your members, the different parts of you to God as weapons for righteousness. Present your members, the different parts of your life, to, as weapons to God. Some Christians might tell, I was just reading a, a book not long ago and it was talking about the early settlers and how they might uh, arrive at an area to, to build, to establish a city on a river and what a tremendous opportunity that will be, but they need timber. And so they march up the, uh, uh, you know, uh, upstream of the river, they find logs, they find trees, they find a forest and they chop them down, remove the trees and then chisel and mark in them what buildings and what families these logs are going to belong to and be utilized for. They, they, they chisel in the destiny of these logs. Then they just flop them into the river and nature takes its course. Gravity, the flow of the water, simply takes it kilometers, hundreds of kilometers sometimes, right down to the city where they catch the logs and give them their allotted destiny. Now, very sadly, a lot of Christians live their life like that's the Christian life. I got saved, but my faith in Jesus, I was chopped down by his grace. He wrote heaven on me. And he just rolled me into the river of life. I'm just floating. Just floating by, and one day I'll die. I'll be taken up out of the river of this world and put in heaven, I suppose. And that's Christian life. Passivity, assumption of of doing good. Does God have much more uh, ignorance of the will of God? Rather, Paul has said that you are commissioned, taken away from slavery, put into the Roman army, and every day of your life is serving God for the sake of his empire and kingdom to bring more into the kingdom and to bring glory to your great king, Jesus Christ. It's an entirely different way of thinking about the Christian life. You are to present yourself, your members, your parts of your life. Allow them to be forged into weapons. You are, you are the imagery might go, you are a captain, you're a centurion. And you have about 80 to 100 people underneath your control, but those aren't different people. They're parts of your life. Finances, time, money, uh, uh, thoughts, uh, plans, goals, holidays, recreation, entertainment, work, skills, giftings. You have all of these things to bring into conformity and command to the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's a, uh, an old uh, biography I was reading just this week, and it gives a good not a perfect, but a, a good imagery or analogy of what it really means to belong to somebody in employment. Uh, but I take an example from a bit further back in history where, where let's say, the contracts were a lot more demanding. The, the, the civil rights were a little bit more lenient, right? Uh, uh, back in the 1860s, there was a man named Bill. At the age of uh, 14 to 15, he was uh, 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 assigned an, an, an administrative apprenticeship role in an iron forging company. It's back in England. And he copies from his uh, paperwork the contract which he was made to sign, and he puts it in the book. We can read it. And, And it's describing, and it's really showing for him, how intense the demands of obedience were under his old employment as a young man. Here's what it says. This is what he signed on his day of employment. And the said Mr. Taylor and John Taylor, his father, Their heirs, their executors, lawyers, administrators, do hereby covenant with the firm that the said Mr. Taylor shall and will be true, just, and faithful to them and every one of them, and the agent or agents of them, and their secrets keep their lawful commands everywhere and in everything obey, and shall do no damage nor allow any damage to be done against them, either seen or known by others, but to the best of his power prevent uh, or forthwith give notice of any injury against the firm. We're a third of the way through. Keeps going. He, the said apprentice, shall not embezzle or waste or lend the goods of the masters unlawfully to any. He shall not hurt or bring any hurt to his said masters or any of their other employees. He shall not do or cause to be done any other hurt. And he shall neither buy nor sell without his master's leave. At cards, dice, or any other lawful games, he shall not play. Taverns, inns, or alehouses, he shall not haunt or frequent, 
unless he is about his master's business, nor from the service of his said masters, day or night, shall he ever absent himself, but in all things, as an honest and faithful apprentice, shall and will demean and behave himself towards the said masters and every one of them, as well as in word and in deed during the entire breadth of this term. All right. You think your employment contract at work was a little bit harsh. This was his entire, it really just looks as if for the entire term of the contract as an apprentice, he is wholly owned by these people. And I was just reading that thinking is not even that level of obedience. Now, just or unjust, according to human laws, is not that level of obedience duly and rightly rendered by him to his masters, which he did and he fulfilled. Is that not even more than so many Christians give to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who bought them by his blood and gave him their spirit? Is that not, is that not a, a level of obedience that not only do most people not give to their bosses today, right or wrong, but they don't even give it to the Lord Jesus? This level of simply everywhere I go, I should defend the glory of and work for the good of my master in heaven. It's a tremendous imagery. But he actually goes on in the 1860s that the, um, uh, 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 a few years, uh, about a year into his apprenticeship, he took sort of inspiration from this employment contract to create for himself a kind of contract or commitment of resolutions to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says at, mind you, the age of 15 going on 16, 15 going on 16, here's, a, here's what he wrote down as resolutions for his life. He says, with deep regret, this day, I look over the past. So much wasted time. He's 16. All right? He's grieving, and I think rightly, the wasted time between 12 when he got saved and 15. Imagine what he might say if he had lived some Christians' lives today. He says, so much precious time wasted. Lost forever. From this day onwards, I desire to redeem every moment and hence have drawn up the following rules, which I pray God, without whose aid our best efforts are sure to fail, may graciously help me to practice. Now, here's his commitment. I'm working these hours, 8.30 I leave home, 6.30 I get home at night. I've committed my life to the, my masters in this regard. Let me use everything else for Jesus. Here's what he says. Resolution number one. I resolve to rise every morning precisely at four o'clock. Number two, to spend from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock a.m. daily in reading the scriptures and in prayer. Number three, on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 a.m. till 6 a.m., I will study arithmetic from 6 till 7, Latin, from 7 till 8, theology. He didn't have a call to the ministry on his life at this point. He just wanted to learn, couldn't go to school because he was working as an apprentice. Number four, on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., I study English grammar, from 6 to 7, geography, from 7 to 8, theology. Sunday mornings, I pray from 4 to 5, and from 5 to 8, I study theology. Number six, as far as may be possible, to spend 30 minutes during the dinner hour with some good book. Number seven, to carry a New Testament in my pocket to be read in spare moments during the day. A little quick fire Bible reading. Number eight, to attend the Sunday and weeknight services and meetings of the church as regularly as possible. Amen. Number nine, to retire to my room at eight o'clock and spend half an hour in self examination and prayer before going to bed. So many of us might hear that and go, well, of course, this is the kind of guy they write biographies about, right? He's the guy, Bill Taylor in his youth, he was called William G. Taylor in his adulthood. He came to Australia from England as a missionary at the age of 26. He brought, by the preaching of the gospel, a tremendous evangelistic spirit to the churches in Brisbane, Sydney, Ipswich, Toowoomba, such that God blessed it and brought hundreds and thousands of people into the kingdom and built multiple churches in major cities through his life work. That was William G. Taylor. Now, here's what we often do. We'll hear that and go, of course he did that, he's a William G. Taylor the evangelist. We must look at it precisely the other way around. Of course God used him. He committed and presented himself and every member of himself to God for usefulness. 
Of course, he was used to wage war for righteousness. He presented his body parts as weapons for God. Don't, don't turn the tale, uh, the, the, the story on its head and assume that, well, these, these super holy Christians, they do that because they had a call. No, they were called and commissioned because they first in the little made faithful commitments to God. They assessed their life. They refused to live the unexamined Christian life. They didn't just assume that because they were Christians, they were presented. They actually, and this is my encouragement, daily do what Bill did. Daily, spend maybe not all of the study like he did there, that is between you and the Lord, but at least in those areas where he said, I will be at church every week, I will be at the midweek meeting every week, I will pray daily and read the word. And here's one of those secrets that Christians don't know, the secret of saying to God through self-examination, Lord, search me and find any wrong way within me. Let not presumptuous sins have their way over me. Let my thoughts, my mind, my meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. I'm just reading the Psalms to you. That we say, not just I'm a Christian, I must be doing okay, let's assume it, but that there is an intentional lifting up of the hood, taking down some drywall in the house, and genuinely assessing the parts of our life and saying, where were my motivations today? Did I waste any money today? Was I selfish today? Did I give up opportunities to preach Jesus Christ to people today? Did I walk past countless uh, 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 letterboxes and put no tracks in them? Where, oh where, is their idleness or where my members are being presented to sin? This is the examined Christian life that Paul is calling us to. Your whole self and every part of your life in service to Jesus Christ, seeing yourself as a weapon in his warfare. As we close out, verse 14 has an amazing promise at the foundation of this entire exhortation. I love, I love the way the Bible does this. It never just leaves commandments hanging. Go and do it. Go and do it. There's always an underlying, what we call an indicative, an underlying promise. You are alive in Jesus, so go and sin no, sin no more. You have been given the Holy Spirit, therefore put to death the sins of your flesh. Here, the promise that sandwiches this entire command is this, verse, tw- verse 14. Sin will have no dominion over you. See, this isn't, he's not describing the hopeful Christian life or some of Christian's life. He's saying this is the state of every true Christian who is alive from the dead. Sin will not grow and grow, take dominion and reign over your entire life and make you obey its passions more and more until you die. That's not the Christian life because the Christian has been poured into by the Holy Spirit, has been given the grace that empowers that commits to righteousness, that learns the warfare of the Lord Jesus. So he's saying to the Christian, and maybe this is you right now, it doesn't even sound like it could be true that that sin you keep on going back to would actually be out of your life. Maybe right now it's, it's even on a medical level, a genuine fleshly addiction and you're going to have to work hard to break something that you've committed to. Or maybe it's just lifestyle, it's habits, it's worldviews. There's something in your life that if I was to say to you, that re- relationship maybe, that action, that personality quirk, which is in direct violation of the Lord's law, that whatever it may be for you, there is a version of you in the future where you're living free of it because the Holy Spirit is powerful. And you say, I can't even imagine that. I say, praise God. He is able to do more and immeasurably more than we ever ask or think. The life of the Christian is one of progressive, not perfection, but progressive, sure victory over sin over time. He says it will not have power over you. You're not, you're not fighting sin right now, wondering who's going to win. You have the Holy Spirit, and the sin will not have dominion over you. I love this, though. Since, here's the foundation, since you're not under law, but under grace. Take some explaining. So I'm not under law, I'm under grace, so sin won't win. Yeah, that, that was the whole sort of presenting on-ramp into chapter 6. What he was saying in chapter 5 is that under law, that is that for individuals who are under the law of God, you are under the judgment of God according to the law. You are weighed down by the anvil of God's law. And you are buffeted on every side with, with piercing spikes of the law of God that if you step to the right or to the left, you are guilty of an infraction, you are pierced in your conscience, and you deserve yet another round of intense torment in hell. 
That's the life of those who are under the law, not saved, but trying to obey. Under that status, under that condition, as Romans calls it, under that way of living and way of being and way of relating to God, under the law, sin reigns because you don't have the Holy Spirit within you. Under that life, which we are all born into naturally, under that, sin has dominion over you because the blood of Jesus has not purchased you. So you are marked by this, dominion of sin over you. Loss in your battle to try and be righteous. Guilt, terror, and fear, and judgment hangs over you for every failing. Paul says, don't pursue righteousness with that mentality. You're under grace now. Under law, sin has dominion over you. Under grace, sin has no dominion over you. Under law, every infraction is met with justice. Under grace, every infraction is met with with mercy. Under the law, every crime is met with torment in hell eventually. Under grace, every sin is met with more grace from God. And that grace empowers and encourages and strengthens that we're not laboring under a harsh judge who is racking up our offenses. We are laboring with a loving father who gave his son to die for us and who every failing picks us up, empowers by his spirit and promises to help us. We are laboring under grace and mercy, not under law, sin and death. It means that for some of you, you need to take that first step of obedience. And if you call yourself Christ's, you need to be baptized into into a life with Christ. You need to be baptized in order to show your obedience, your belonging, your love to Christ. That's, that's step one of the Christian life. Uh, the second may be that you need to see yourselves as Bill Taylor in his teenage years. You need to see yourself as commissioned, whether you're called to be an international missionary, a pastor and preacher, or just a Christian, all of whom are called to be evangelists. You have to consider yourself as commissioned and go home today and assess your Christian life. Maybe for the first time. But for others of us who are here today, you are not yet believers in Jesus. You are not saved. Uh, You do not have confidence that the law is satisfied. You are still just trying to be righteous to get to heaven. Maybe you, you deny Christ. You've known of him and you despise him. I don't know where you are. But for anybody who falls under the category of not yet a Christian, not yet alive from the dead, not yet indwelt by the Spirit, not yet living the Christian life with Jesus under his word, for you, the command of God is stop trying to work your way into salvation. Stop trying to earn your way, follow your way, walk your way into God's grace. God's grace is never given as a result of effort. God's grace is only ever giving, given as a gift, a free gift. If you say, but I don't deserve that, I need to work it, you don't deserve it. That is precisely what makes the gospel a free gift. It's grace, not a wage. God looks at your unworthiness, and he was gracious and loving enough to kill Jesus in your place. Christ looks at your your sinfulness, and he is loving enough to come to earth to die for us in your place. Jesus rose to life, and he is now in heaven, and he calls you. Do not try and, through the stony, rocky, sharp path of law, try and make it to God. You'll never make it. Instead, under grace, come to me, be forgiven, be adopted, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and then you will be transformed. That's the call of the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the writing of Paul, which is nothing less than the words of the living God. Thank you that through this man you have spoken, and you have spoken in pen and paper that we might read it and study it for millennia to come. We thank you, Lord God, for this gift to the church, which is the word of God, the foundation of everything we believe, and the authority over each one of our lives. Pray, Lord God, that what Paul has commanded here in Romans 6 would be received as that. Not something to be excused away or wiggled out of, but a a command of Jesus to be obeyed. But, Lord God, please let none of us, please let none of us try and obey, try and 
satisfy, try and uh, follow the commands of Paul here in this passage in our own strength. Please point us to the finished work of Jesus, which paid for each of our sins. Please remind us that it is by the Holy Spirit's power alone that we can fulfill your commandments and walk free of sin. And we pray that this would be a realized reality in each of our lives, that sin has no dominion. Lord God, let us not set the, 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 the plumb line or the average of the Christian life based on what we see in a very, very compromised age. Lord God, let us look to Scripture to see the command of the Christian life that we are supposed to attain to and make this church, Lord God, one that is given over in the individual and in the corporate, entirely given over to be forged as weapons in the warfare for righteousness for the Lord Jesus' sake. We pray this in his name and for his glory. And everybody said...